We already saw that with uh, substitution and elimination. Because in SN2, you're attacking a tetrahedral alpha carbon, and so you only get one stereoisomer. Remember, you get the inverted stereoisomer. But in SN1, you're attacking a trigonal planar um, uh, alpha carbon that's a carbocation. And then we get racemization, which means two stereoisomers. Also, in E2, in E2, the alpha carbon is tetrahedral, and you only get one of the cis and trans isomers. You're supposed to use the antiperiplanar transition state to decide whether it's cis or trans. But in E1, you're attacking a trigonal planar carbocation uh, alpha carbon. And again, you get two stereoisomers. We saw that you get both uh, a mix of cis and trans. So this explains the reactions we've seen so far. Well, how many products do we expect to get here then? One or two? Two. Because what's the, the, this? the top. That's right, because this is certainly trigonal planar. All right, and that's going to hold for all the next few reactions for the next few weeks, right? Because we're going to keep attacking double bonds, and double bonds are always trigonal planar, so we can generally expect a maximum of two stereoisomers. Why do I say maximum? Well, again, if we weren't forming stereocenters here, then there would only be one product. We can only get two if there we're actually forming stereocenters. Again, if we were just attacking uh, ethylene over here and we're not forming any stereocenters, then we'd only get one product. But there's a maximum of two. Okay, so let's see if we can draw the other product. Well, the other product is just like you said. We can have the hydrogens come in from the other direction. All right, and again, I'm kind of simplifying the mechanism here, but the basic mechanism is like this. This is good enough. Basically, one hydrogen, uh, the two hydrogens attack at the same time. That's the only thing that matters. The two hydrogens attack at the same time. So let's see if you can draw the product from that. Maybe you already have. Uh, okay, you're ahead of me. So that would give us these, and those did reverse. Okay, you got it. This is what you got. Okay, so now the two hydrogens come from above, uh, and that pushes the substituents up. And anyone who used to be on a wedge stays on the wedge, because they're not getting pulled in and out of the board, they're just getting pushed up. So this gives us the two products. Um, so in both of these pictures, everyone who used to be on a dash stays on a dash, and anyone who used to be on a wedge stayed on a wedge. They just got to get pushed up or down. Ah, oh, this wasn't the best example. Yeah, this wasn't the best example. So you always have to check to see whether they're really different. Um, so normally these would be enantiomers. Normally these would be enantiomers, but you're right, they're meso. So they're really identical to each other. You can see that because if you took the bottom one and flipped it 180 degrees, they would lay on top of each other. But uh, suppose that this had been an ethyl group. If we just say this is an ethyl group instead of a methyl group, then we really get two different stereoisomers. But that just shows you that if you're trying to draw all the products, it's only a maximum of two. You have to check whether the two pictures are really different or not. Uh, even here, even though we were producing stereocenters, even though we were producing stereocenters, we still only got one product because uh, it was meso. So you always have to check to see whether the same or different. All right, now these would really be different. Okay, so that's the basic idea here for uh, hydrogenation. Um, so this is one case where when you're, it helps to actually draw dashes and wedges around a double bond, and you can show things coming from two directions. I guess that's what confused me about like organometallic and mercuriation and hydro bro whatever the mm -hmm. other one because I realized that sometimes you switch one and so that was what like, was confusing me. So right. Like, okay. Yeah. Reaction. So it's important to just nail down for every single reaction um, mm -hmm. what direction things are coming in. So this one we now know from the mechanism since both hydrogens come from the spec same speck of palladium they're coming in sin. And now we just have to go through the same process for every other reaction. If we understand the mechanism we'll understand whether it's sin or anti. Okay, uh, so let's do a synthesis problem. Uh, so here's the starting material and here's the product, and your job is to come up with reagents that will take us from the starting material to the product. So what would be the answer here? From there to there, that would be from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. What reagents could take the starting material on the left to the product on the right? K. 
Can you do, well first you'd have to do Romination. And why is that? Because you don't have a functional group. Now, that's a, a good point. Um, now, it turns out, I should have mentioned this before, double bonds are functional groups. Double bonds are functional groups, even double bonds between two carbons. So aren't you starting from there to here, or are you? Well, what does this arrow mean? This arrow means that the starting material is on the left, and oh, the product okay. is on the right. You do it, not how the professor usually does. Yeah, although even on the exam, on an exam, if this was a synthesis problem, he would write the starting material on the left, and the product on the right. And he would ask you to go from the left hand to the right hand side. Again, sometimes when he's working out these problems as a thought process, sometimes as a thought process, he might sometimes write the final product on the left and draw a retrosynthesis arrow. But I don't think he ever uses retrosynthesis arrows on his exams anyway. On an exam, a synthesis problem will still get set up like this. So again, the point is, if this is the starting material and this is the product. Addition of H2 and some sort of catalyst. Metal catalyst. Good. Okay, so that's just a quick review. So the point is, how do you know when to use this reaction for syntheses? Well, the key point is um, when you want to get rid of functional groups. Notice the interesting thing about this is we produced a molecule with no functional groups. Uh, and we really know very few ways to do that. So if you notice a product with no or fewer functional groups, there's a good chance you're using hydrogenation. Obviously, this gets rid of a double bond. But anytime you want to get rid of functional groups, maybe the way to get rid of the functional group is turn it into a double bond and then hydrogenate. Because we don't know many other ways to get rid of that. So even if this hadn't been a double bond to start with, maybe this would be a good way to attack this. Uh, all right, so then we use the hydrogenation. So now this is what we would call defunctionalization. Because we're getting rid of a functional group and not replacing it with another functional group. So again, it's worth noting double bonds are functional groups. Now we know a way to functionalize and a way to defunctionalize. How do you put functional groups in? Well, that was the method you were mentioning a second ago, um, radical halogenation. If you need to put a functional group in where there was no functional group before, you would use radical halogenation. And suppose you need to totally remove a functional group and not replace it with another one, that's when you would use hydrogenation. Let's do another synthesis problem. So again, here on the left is our original starting material, and here on the right is our product. And the question is, what reagents do we need to add to go from left to right? It might take us more than one step. Sounds good. Well, let's talk our way through that. Sounds like you have the right idea. Now, the first thing that should go through your mind is the final product has no functional groups. And we know very few ways to have no functional groups. One of the very few ways we have to remove functional groups is hydrogenation. So there's an excellent chance that our last step will be hydrogenation, palladium on carbon. So there's an excellent chance that this will be our last step. However, what functional group do we need to add this to for it to work? Double bond. We need an alkene, and this is not an alkene yet. So we need, we need somehow to turn this into something with a double bond, into an alkene. Well, now we have to go back to our synthetic toolbox. Do we know any ways to put in double bonds? Well, as you remember, that's elimination. Um, uh, and so this would be a great chance to use an E2 reaction. Um, E2 is a great way to do elimination, and you put in a strong bulky base. Say, terpetal oxide is an excellent uh, strong bulky base. And that would give us this guy over here. And that's exactly what we needed for the hydrogenation. This is an excellent example of how to do synthesis problems. Notice that we were, part, uh, we were basically using retrosynthesis. That is, we were working backwards from the final product. I didn't use a retrosynthesis arrow, because I think retrosynthesis arrows are confusing. 
But we basically did retrosynthesis. We asked, how do we make something with no functional groups? Well, hydrogenation. But then we need an alkene. And how do we make an alkene? Elimination. So we were working this way. Remember, when you're doing uh, these problems, then you want to put the product on the far right of your piece of paper and the starting material on the far left. So you have plenty of room. Uh, the only problem was with the mechanism you drew, because remember, the base attacks the base attacks the beta hydrogen. You might still need to, uh, uh, on the final, you should, would still be expected to be able to draw that mechanism. So remember that the E2 mechanism is kind of complicated. You always want to label the alpha and the beta carbons. It's actually bringing back pleasant memories from the last midterm. But anyway, um, a common mistake is to take the hydrogen from the alpha carbon. No, we take it from the beta carbon, and that's what puts the double bond over here. Okay, but your synthesis was correct. 